Hey there, YouTube land. And today I'm starting something different and a little new. It's going to be a lot of the old with some of the new stuff put in there. And it's going to be sort of a podcast, which I'm starting out as a kind of a singular thing, and I'm hoping to get more people involved in along the way. Uh, not an original idea. There's lots of podcasts out there, but this one specifically was an idea that came to me by uh, listening to and watching actually a few uh, podcasts from uh, Lawsburg and 7 Eleven. So if you haven't checked out his channel yet, Please do so. He's got a really great channel. He just did two updates just recently. Actually, just now. I just finished watching them. Because I was watching... Uh, I'm trying to catch up on some channel stuff today. I've been watching like Parson Burger, Hallsburg 7-Eleven, a, a lot of the guys. So, uh, basically, I'll be getting shout-outs along the way. <clears throat> Hopefully, getting people in here every once in a while. My son actually does a podcast with me, but he hasn't been over in a bit because he's, he's been under the weather. Anyway, I'll be back in a minute. But for right now... Well, I gotta get all my stuff ready, get my tea ready, because we're probably gonna be talking for a while. And uh until I come back, it's faded. So I'm back and I got my tea, so we're ready to go. Has to be broken up into a few uh, different pieces here, <clears throat> or we'll be fading black. Uh, anyway, first off, I went to the flea market today. Uh, I picked up a few things. Got everything here that I'm going to show you for three dollars. It's all DVD, not Blu-ray. I did almost pick up some Blu-rays. They had a lot of like steel books there. Some of them were uh, high priced. I did. I'm not like a steel book collector that knows a lot about this stuff. A bit to a bit steel book stuff like uh, guys like Movie Cave Dave. Uh, you know, there's a lot of people that know a lot about steelbooks, and uh, I'm not one of those people. I have a few, but I don't know which ones are rare, which ones aren't. Though he did have some there at uh, various prices. And uh, let us start out now with some uh, DVDs I got. And I'll tell you why I picked them up. So, first off, I went to this one table. And he had like a bunch of, like, kind of like more expensive stuff. And right in the back, he had like a bunch of DVDs. And the one I did pick up on uh, for a buck was uh, for my MGM's collection. I collect MGM films on DVD and I, I'm trying to get all the MGM's. So every time I see one, I pick one up. And I usually I pick it up for like a dollar, two dollars. I don't want to pick like their DVDs, they don't have any features on them usually. So I picked up uh, Delta Force 2. I have Delta Force on Blu-ray actually. <clears throat> but uh, this one, it does have a Blu-ray release, but I've heard it's not a very good Blu-ray release at all. It's actually pretty crappy and it has no features on it. And the uh, quality of the DVD is just as good as quality of the Blu-ray. That's what I've read in a few places. So uh, I was going to grab this anyway because even if I had this on Blu-ray I would have grabbed it because I like uh, the MGM releases. I like the way their covers are done. <clears throat> they, put, like, they always have the original theatrical trailers on them. You know, at, in the very least that's actually something. Uh, the Billy Draggles in this one here with, uh, I think it's John someone, uh, John P. Ryan who took over kind of like for uh, Lee Marvin I think it's in the first one. So there it is, Delta Force 2. And uh, I like these movies. This is one of the later canon films. I collect canon as well. I like these kind of action type of films. Just fun to watch. Uh, <clears throat> just a fun, cool little action film. I want to grab that one. Now I picked up kind of a cheesy one. Uh, not a good case. Got to get, replace the case on this one. And that is a 90s vampire flick. No, 2000s. I guess. 2000s vampire flick called The Forsaken. Uh, not the best movie. But I did have fun with it back in the day, and I did kind of remember it. And I never come across this. So uh, I thought, yeah, now's the time. Uh, pick, it, pick it up. So it's got, like, uh, Keir Smith, who was in Dawson's Creek, and uh, Brandon Fair, who I think was in uh, Roswell, <clears throat> and a very gorgeous girl, and I can't remember what she was in. But I'm sure she said something as well. But uh, I know Keir Smith. He still does a lot of stuff. Uh, he was in the uh, new... New uh, kind of the remake of My Bloody Valentine, uh, one that I do have on DVD and Blu-ray actually the remake and the original. I don't have the original Blu-ray though. I, pick, I missed it on. Uh, I picked up finally just in the DVD edition uh, for the collector. I still have to get the collection. I've seen the movies. I just haven't owned them yet. Uh, so finally it was for you know for less than a dollar. I picked the collector. So uh, if like a Blu-ray comes up for a fairly cheap, I'll grab that as well. This was the uh, Canadian edition. So. Uh, one of the cool things about it, even though it's the eco cases, it does have the uh, the French side as well. And some people like that, that bothers them. And I'm just the opposite. I like kind of like different things like that. 
And then I grabbed the Wes Craven movie I don't have that I wish had a <clears throat> like a Screen Factor Arrow like edition. It's one that I like, but it's not one that I guess a lot of like uh, credit or praise. I thought it was a really cool movie. I thought Cillian Murphy was great in it, and that is Red Eye. Uh, I thought it was a great thriller. Thriller. I thought that uh, Wes Craven did a did a great job. And again, I got this one for less than a uh, less than a dollar. So, again. <clears throat> Next up is uh, one of my favorite movie <laughs> series, actually, and uh, some people say it's a guilty pleasure because it's not a well liked series, and uh, still has a sticker on. Actually, I have to get like uh, cases for them because the way it's done. Uh, they did a bunch of these here where they like do a spindle sort of thing where they put one movie right on top of another. So I'll probably get cases down the road. So I picked up the uh, the Cruel Intentions trilogy, especially now where they're doing the new Cruel Intentions like um, sequel series with uh, Sarah Michelle Gellar actually in it. So <clears throat> of course you have Cruel Intentions 1, which has Ryan Fleet, uh, Reese Witherspoon, Sarah Michelle Gellar. Uh, just a great little film. I love this movie. And uh, I have like, there's certain reasons that, are, that it really sticks with me. Uh, great soundtrack as well, by the way. Uh, then there's Cruel Intentions 2, uh, Manchester Prep, because actually it was going to be a series on Fox called Manchester Prep. I was actually very excited about that. The series got canceled. Uh, there's kind of a whole like uh, uproar but a couple of the scenes, which would be really silly now. Uh, basically, there's a girl riding a horse for the kind of for the first time, and she kind of like she is feminine awakened while riding the horse. <clears throat> Uh, nothing shown. It's just like it's very, it's very cheesy, very, very funny scene. But they thought it was kind of pushing the edges on it, so they didn't uh, kind of uh, they canceled the show. So they made a movie out of it. They took the episodes that they had, made a film out of that, and put in like a nude scene to like get an R rating for it. And then they they did Crow Intentions three, which does have actually Care Smith in it as well. So there's a Care Smith uh, thing on there. So they're all in here, in a. Uh, So if you only see Chrome Tensions 3, but if you open the thing, they're all in mint condition. Well, they're all been very well taken care of. I actually feel that like they did number one. So we got Chrome Tensions, Chrome Tensions 2, that has a Robin Dunn in it, and uh, Chrome Tensions 3. See, there's Kara Smith right there. And Chrome Tensions 1 and 2, well, Chrome Tensions, Manchester Prep, is actually a prequel. Uh, where uh, Sebastian first meets uh, Catherine, and uh, Cruel Intentions 3 is with the cousins of, uh, of Catherine, <clears throat> cousin Catherine, and it's kind of, uh, I like the twist, it's got, it goes darker, it's a darker film than the, uh, than the other one, other two films, and uh, very darker, very much darker in certain ways actually, because the guy that's, like they have these, there's this kind of like seduction thing, and a game that, that's, that's played, but one of the guys plays it in a very dark, very nasty way. And uh, I really did kind of like the way that the Patrick character was played in uh, Chrome Tensions 3. It's not a well-liked film, but it's just one that I particularly like myself. So um, I'm going to drink a little bit of my tea, and I'm going to come back, and we're going to talk about that new uh, Tenebrae Sue book release, because I've gone through it completely. So uh, let's get to that. One of the highlights for me this week was uh, a good friend of mine, James, <laughs> gave me this here for my birthday, uh, Tenebrae. Yeah. And uh, it's my favorite Argento film. I'm a huge fan of Giallo's, <laughs> Jelly, uh, and the whole genre. I just love everything about it. So it was the day that my better half was gone out of town on business for the night. Actually, for a couple of nights. She came back one day earlier. And uh, I was decided that, you know, I was by myself and came at just the right time. I was going to get in. I was going to dive into this and see how it was. So uh, let's talk about this. So, there are some features on here, and uh, there's some pretty good ones. The quality of the print itself, the print's really good. It's just a great print. Synapse uh, had a print on it, and they thought it was okay. They went back to do extra work on that print, that, so it took them longer than they originally anticipated to get this one out here, because they wanted to really work hard on getting us a really good print of the film. So they went above and beyond with that. The Maitland McD McDonald, uh, McDonald, I think that's a print's name, uh, commentary on this is very informed and very good. I haven't watched the com listened to the commentaries on my Arrow edition of this, so I don't know what those are like. I know that uh, that Kim Newman's pretty good with stuff like this, but this one has a great commentary. There's a couple like uh, extras, like uh, there's the uh, there's an alternate ending and an alternate opening uh, for the film. It's really kind of just a different music type of thing, 
that's being used. There's cool electros on here. But the reason to get this is something called Yellow Fever. And it's a documentary. It runs about nine minutes long. It's done by High Rising Productions. So that's Cal and Model. My cat in the background there. <laughs> uh, Cal and Model's group. And uh, it's just a great, great uh, documentary. It really dives into the whole genre. The whole genre. It, starts, it talks about it from back to the original jellos that were done back, way back to 1959. It talks about the uh, books, uh, like the Edgar Wallace books and all those. And Ed Christie's, all things that inspired uh, these to be called jellos in the first place. It goes into all the different directors. Some of these directors actually, uh, <laughs> Roberto Lindsay, uh likes to say stuff about, uh, he doesn't like to give any much credit to the uh, other, uh, to, well, especially to uh, Argeno. For some reason, he just, he, I guess he thinks Argeno gets way too much credit, and he's always saying, you know, my jellos are masterpieces, and and uh, Argento learned so much stuff from me. Uh, well, people say that I stole from Argento, but in actuality, I, I had a much more clever idea for having a man in black. It's just really cool. So it's really fun. There's a lot of people on it. Dariano said she's on it. He wrote he wrote some stuff uh, for that. Uh, Lucio Cozzi is on there. Uh, I'm probably butchering some of the names. I apologize if I am. Uh, Dario Gento's on there. Richard Stanley, uh, the guy that, a uh, great director. He did Dust, Dust Devil and he did uh, Hardware. And if you got the Lost Souls documentary, uh, I really have to pick that up. I watched that one on TV. Uh, it's a really great documentary. Uh, so he does, and he dated uh, Z. Argento, uh, which is uh, his, uh, well, it's the name of D. Argento's daughter. Actually, her actual given name is Aria Argento, because when he went to name her Azia, uh, they didn't, uh, they didn't kind of, uh, they didn't let him. <laughs> yeah, seriously, in, in Italy, they didn't let him, but they would let, they would let her go with Aria. But she's known... <laughs> I know she took the name that her, that they gave her originally, Azia, and that's what she goes with. Pronounced, uh, no, pronounced Azia, spelled A S I A, like Asia. So a lot of people will call it, call her Asia Argento, at times, uh, which is you know it's spelled that way. So, but uh, anyway, so the, she, uh, Richard Stanley, uh, dated her at one point as well, and uh, he talks a lot about the uh, about the stuff that Argento did, and uh, just some great stuff. There's some amazing work with. Uh, hey you. Um, <laughs> with uh on there it is an incredible in-depth documentary there's like some trailers along the way and they would do them in a kind of a cool way you have like you split the screen into four and there'll be four trailers that'll be showing at the same time like one trailer you'll hear like the, the words and stuff for and but there'll be like three other trailers there on that screen at the exact same time and it's just so cool the way it's done they go through a lot of the different jellos that uh, basically uh had a lot of influence on the time they talk about uh they talk about tenebrae they talk about deep red they, uh, they really get into the fact that Tenebrae is kind of this watershed moment for Argento. It's a turning point. Um, and that is just incredible when they're talking about the fact that, you know, okay, here he is. Uh, he's been making all these movies, these, like, these, these Jalo movies. And every time, you know, the killer's, you know, spoiler, the killer's a female. Uh, and all of a sudden with Tenebrae, it's different. Uh, the, the Who the killer is, is, is different, is significantly different. And then it changes from there on. It does a flip. And you'll, uh, as you watch the movie, you'll find out exactly. Uh, and when you watch these movies here, and you think about the director that did it, and you think about the time in his life that, the, that these movies were done, uh, then you really, really start to understand that uh, some great stuff. Uh, and you can actually kind of see uh, the growth. And not just the growth in like the filmmaking, but you can see the growth in, in Argento as a person, how that changes and shifts the type of films that he makes and the type of people that he actually makes as a killer so you can see that the ki who he does as a killer who he has as a hero it's a very personal thing for Argento and uh, the actually uh, Richard Stanley does a really good job of talking about that in the documentary I really do recommend this film if you're interested in Italian filmmaking and jowls at all if you picked up things you before this is a great little one here I think it's limited I'm not sure like 3,000 or something like that so I'm um, the don't normally sell out, uh, but nowadays, you know, it's starting to get to the point where things are starting to sell out pretty fast uh, with a lot of this stuff, uh, but I don't think, this one's not sold out yet, so uh, I would suggest grabbing it. It's, uh, it's a really cool uh, cool set. Look Again, it looks really, really gorgeous. Uh, there's a booklet in here as well. I listened to the soundtrack. That's also, it's excellent. It's a real, and uh, I love the soundtrack to, uh, to Tenebrae. There's some good reading in here as well for the, uh, for this, but a lot of the reading kind of, uh, is all 
pretty much the same thing that you've uh, that you've that you've heard in the documentary and into the into the commentary. I do recommend that if you're a really big fan, if you find that you get this and you're like a huge fan of this movie and you find that you love the documentary, look into uh, companies like Shameless who put out a lot of different jallos and um, and look and, and Arrow as well. They put out uh, some really cool stuff. They have a new one coming out in uh, in April, uh, kind of like a death one. Death. Uh, there's two death films on it, and I can't remember the name of them right now. But uh, like Death Box the Cane, and another one. Uh, I know the Arrow recently put out like the uh, Black Cat set, which I do recommend. Uh, that has your that has Black Cat Lucha Fulci, which is not really a Jello. It's more it's one of Fulci's weaker uh, stories, but it's fun nonetheless. Kind of like Manhattan Baby. It's good, but it's not it's not up there with some of his other stuff. However, there is on that Black Cat set a movie by Sergio Martino, who was one of the best Jello directors. He only made a few, but the few that he made, he made are some pretty genius stuff. And the one that I'm talking about right now is Your Vice is a Locked Room and Only I Have the Key. That is actually a throwback to his first Jello that he made, which was called The Strange Vices of Mrs. Ward, which starred Edwidge Finch. Now, Edwidge Finch was, is in Your Vice has a Locked Room and Only I Have the Key as well. She has a smaller part, but she is Mrs. Ward. She's actually the star. Of uh, that one, and the one of the notes that Killer Censor actually has that phrase on it, and uh, later it's used in this one. It's not a sequel or anything like that. It just is a throwback or nod to his first Jello, and in a very big way since he made the title of the uh, of the film. I really do recommend it. It's a great set, the Black Cat set by Arrow. Uh, great stuff. The Fulci one is the weaker one of the two, and uh, it's pretty much you know any Fulci fan, most Fulci. Fans, historians, Tim Lucas, though, will tell you. Uh, well, Tim Lucas is more of a bad guy, but uh, <coughs> he's like the Italian stuff. So. But I will tell you that, you know, there's certain Fulci's that, you know, that are up there. <clears throat> this That Cat is not one that's up there. It's a good film, it's decent, but it's not one of the best films. <coughs> Jello is one that is a genre that I, that I fell in love with really early on. And I've been watching before I was way, way too, uh, too young to be watching these films. So it's something that I feel strongly about and passionate about, that I talk a lot about. And my channel here, you're going to see a lot of that. And when I come back, we're going to talk uh, about a little section called called uh, basically spoiler talk. And that's where I'm going to take a movie that I watched recently, and I'm going to totally spoil it for you. Something that I've seen, and uh, that I've seen recently. That, but it's going to be spoiled for you because I just thought it was completely hilarious and it's something that you got to know about. So anyway, when I come back, we are going to talk about Ricardo Fidi's film, Murder Obsession, put up by a rare, rare video. You want to be here for this. Hey there, so I'm back with spoiler talk. And that means we're going to talk about Murder Obsession. This is uh, from Rare Video, and it's by director Ricardo Fidi. Ricardo Fidi is kind of best known for like uh, a lot of the, some of the supernatural stuff that he did. He did a lot of stuff. He did the very first... Uh, Italian talking uh, a film uh, called Am A Vampire, I Vampiri, Vampire, Vampiri, I can't remember now, but it's on uh, one of the Arrow sets actually. See my cat in the background, she's like totally photobombing this. So I watched this movie last night uh, and I was like, okay, I don't think I've seen this one, or at least I haven't seen it in a long time. And I have seen this before, but under a different name, I'm not sure what it was, what name it was under. <laughs> now this one here, although it does say uh, language Italian with English subtitles, it's actually dubbed, and uh, there's only about two or three scenes where uh, basically the, it's actually an Italian language with the uh, English subtitles down the bottom type of thing. I guess scenes that were, uh, that for some reason just uh, they didn't have English uh, uh, dub of it. <laughs> but I prefer to have English subtitles with the, lang with the actual language dubbed in. Uh, sometimes, however, what happens is that some of these directors get the actors to talk in, uh, in English, even if their English isn't the greatest. To actually sell it to a uh, to an audience better over in uh, over here. So basically, this movie here is batshit crazy. <clears throat> the movie starts off with Laura Gemser actually taking off her clothes. <laughs> what a shock! Uh, Laura Gemser is a famous actress who did a lot of the Black Emmanuel movies. In, in one of the very first Emmanuel films, uh, Laura Gemser actually plays a masseuse uh, and kind of erotic masseuse in a scene. And actually, she went on to do her own series of Emmanuel films. Side note. So, Lord Gemser is, is taking off her clothes when this guy comes in and he starts choking her to death. So I'm like thinking, well, this is a very short scene, short role for Lord Gemser, but 
maybe that's not such a bad thing. <clears throat> and then it kind of comes out in a kind of a whole Brian De Palma type of way uh, with the whole, okay, this is a movie they're filming. And the, the, the guy keeps choking her. <clears throat> and he's kind of in a trance sort of. He's like, keeps on choking. And she's like, you know, do you trying to choke me for real? And he's like, you know, sorry about that. Then he goes in and he starts playing a song on his guitar. Yeah, he does that. So he takes his girlfriend <clears throat> and he brings her up to see his mother. He, all of a sudden he has this inexplicable urge to go see his mom. And his mom is a kind of a weird character. She lives with their, uh, like with her sis, or kind of like assistant, and like a groundskeeper, butler, whatever, named Oliver. And uh, <clears throat> mother comes and gives him this really long, huge hug that, I'm not going to lie, bores on incestuous. Uh, and uh, you'll find, it, there's, there's more to it, you find out later. And all of a sudden she sees that he has a girl with him. And he says, this is my secretary. This is not say it's his girlfriend. But uh, basically he, uh, for some reason he feels the need to tell his mom it's the secretary. So his mother later on goes to bed. And he goes in and he speaks to his mother to see how she's doing. Because Oliver said that his mother is not feeling the greatest. She's not, she's not her health is not well. <clears throat> and uh, his mother's wearing like a, almost like a see-through type of thing. Uh, very attractive woman. Anita Strindberg. Uh, and, uh, so yeah, that happens. And then there's a, kind of a scene. And it's kind of awkward. Again, it's kind of weird. Is there an incestual type thing going on? And he talked about the fact that <clears throat> years ago, his father had been beating his mother. And he killed his dad. He stabbed them, but he didn't remember. So uh, it's like something that's been like uh, been bothering him for years. So the next day, a bunch of his friends come up, and uh, that we're making the film. So you get the uh, cinematographer, director, whatever comes up. And he always has a camera with him. He carries a camera with him at all times. This is going to be important. Uh, and there's two girls come up, of course, Laura Gemser, and because you know she's going to come because she's trying to choke her before. Yeah, I don't get that either. And uh, another girl comes up as well, like another actress on the film. <clears throat> so basically there's like uh, three of them. Well, there's those three and there's him and his girlfriend <clears throat> and his mom and Oliver, the groundskeeper. They're perfect groundskeeper. That's a perfect word. Anyway, so that night <clears throat> that they come up, Lord Gamster's in the bathtub being naked because she's good at that in films. And uh, it's a black love person tries to uh comes in and tries to drown her but uh somebody hears her screaming and the, the attempted killer runs off so first the uh the girl comes in and then the photographer comes in to see how everything's going on the photographer's wearing black gloves i'm serious so the next day they go out to uh this place we used to like to go and like think and stuff when he was a kid with a waterfall really beautiful and uh, his girlfriend stays home. <clears throat> the reason his girlfriend stays home is because she's had a sleepless night. She's been having a nightmare. So for 20 minutes of this movie, we're basically hearing a better nightmare. And it's about a black mass that's going on. And a spider with hands. Uh, and kind of these mummy zombie type of like creatures. And there's blood coming out of their mouths. And she's caught in a spider's web. And then she's, and, and she's run through the woods. And there's, she, her shirt's coming off because nudity. And... Uh, and then she's tied up to this sacrificial thing, and her shirt's ripped open. It looks like the person's going to stab her, but does it because nudity. And uh, just it keeps going like that. <clears throat> I'm serious. It just keeps going like that for like 20 minutes with all this weird shit. <clears throat> and this is where I got to stop with another side. Fact time. <clears throat> the effects in this film were er, was partially done by Sergio Stevaletti. Sergio Stevaletti is a famous, like, he's kind of like the Tom Savani of Italy. He does a lot of, like, really good effects. And this is one of his very first things that he ever worked on. And there actually is an interview with uh, Sergio Stevaletti on here. Sergio Stevaletti, if you know Italian stuff, then you probably know the, the film that most people know that he directed, which is The Wax Mask. Now, <clears throat> The Wax Mask was a movie that was meant to be a production between Lucio, Lucio Fulci and Dario Argento. There were some problems in getting it made, and unfortunately, by the time all those problems got worked out, Lucio Fulci had passed away. So, with the script already being done, uh, 
D'Argento kind of like just went back, kind of did the more producing type of thing, like he did with Demons with Umberto Bava. And uh, Sergio Stavletti got his chance and got to uh, direct The Wax Mask. Uh, I find the movie actually pretty cool. I like The Wax Mask. I don't have it. On, uh, I used to have it on, D on VHS back in the day, but uh, it's one that I, I don't know if it's on DVD or it's on Blu-ray. Uh, you guys can let me know. It's one I've uh, looked for. I don't want to get like a German media book release. I actually like the other. It's a Region 2 release or Region 1 release type thing that I'll get. Uh, <clears throat> I'm not big with, uh, with all the media books when I can't read the stuff on the inside. <laughs> That's just me. Uh, but uh, anyway, he does a lot of the effects for the nightmare sequence and there's a lot of cheesy stuff and that it's early effects from uh, from Stavlady. it's not like the stuff you do would do later on with like with Steinel syndrome and uh and films like that but uh <clears throat> it's it's cool it's cheesy it's like 1981 or something like that that this movie's done so you gotta like take into account the time that was done so anyway she she stays home because she's had this huge nightmare and spent and he by the time she finished talking about it, he doesn't want to talk to her really and we don't know why at first, but we find out. So they're up to this uh, to this area that he's showing them that I mentioned before. And they all kind of go off in their own separate way. Then we see Lord Gamser sitting on like a beach area. And uh, he comes up. And he's got a knife. right? So first we see like a knife. And then we see like the, the guy, the main star, the one I'm talking about. You know, the guy that accidentally kind of choked the girl. Choked her earlier. And he's got a knife. And so she... She looks at him, he has a knife in his hand like he's going to stab her, and he laughs and puts it in his pocket. Then he sits down to talk to her. And she says, were you really trying to st to strangle me up there? I just, I just want to know. He said, I don't know. I've had this psychotraumatic problem. He says things that no person would ever say in real life. Uh, anyway, so this conversation ends with him putting his hand in her shirt and caressing her breast. Uh, which culminates in them making love. So I'm guessing one of the big reasons he didn't want his girlfriend up at this time was because he kind of liked uh, Lord Gempser and he wanted to get to get with her, kind of on the side type of thing. So this happens and he falls asleep. Meanwhile, the the guy with the camera is there and he's taking pictures. When the guy wakes up alongside Lord, Lord Gempser, we're pretty much aware right away that although she's breathing, she's dead. There's no like, oh, I wonder if she's dead. No, she's dead. <clears throat> there's a big slit, like, uh, well, there's blood that's supposed to be a slit. <clears throat> so, oh, sorry. So he thinks he killed her. And uh, in one of his, like, uh, trances again, he thinks, oh, my God, because the knife, bloody knife's beside him. Now, meanwhile, we cut back to the photographer who was booted it back to the house and he's writing something down and of course right after that sequence he goes to walk at the door and then an axe comes down on a dummy's head that opens up that's supposed to be the photographer it's pretty cheesy <clears throat> uh but so the photographer's dead then the other girl comes back and uh, he, he's taken off pretty much he's he's flipped out at this point uh not like they're not going crazy, but he's just like freaked out because, you know, oh, he's killed a girl. He killed his dad years ago. <clears throat> so then basically we learned that uh, the other girls looked at the film that uh, that the photographer took. And she realizes, oh, this is the killer. <clears throat> and then she's killed. So around this time, the girlfriend notices that the necklace that she saw in her dream is on the mom. And the mom and Oliver, the tenant, both look at her really strange when she looks at the necklace. And the, so the mom goes upstairs. Then the girl finds the head of one of her friends. That's when the real, she realizes some serious shit's going on. And she runs out. We see her run through the woods and, of course, get her clothes ripped off again. It's almost like a phantom killer type of thing without the misogyny. <clears throat> and we see the killer chasing after her. And coming towards her and it comes back to the guy. He's just come home. So anyway, he's just come home, and he tells his mom, "I can't, I can't, I can't go through this again. Killed my dad. Looks like he killed this girl that I, that I kind of liked. Uh, I can't find my girlfriend anywhere. I can't find anybody." So then she tells him the truth. She says, "Okay, I've got to tell you. It's, it's beneath me up inside. Years ago, 
the Oliver, basically, uh, your father wanted to get rid of Oliver. And uh, Oliver just wouldn't go. And he was obsessed with me. And it was, and I would try not to be around him when, I, when, when your dad was gone. But one day he came and he raped me. And I, after a while I had to submit and he would rape me all the time. So your dad came home one day and Oliver got in a fight with your dad and stabbed him. And then you came in the room and like in shock, he, he looked at you and he said, look, look what you did. You killed your father because <clears throat> cause he was beating your mother and you were protecting. Him. And so that's what you thought. And uh, you never really remembered anything. So he's, so he's mad. He wants to confront Oliver now. And uh, he goes downstairs goes to Oliver's room, opens up the door, <clears throat> and a tape recorder starts playing. Because Oliver's lying there dead, and there's like countless chalice beside him. Said, if you are hearing this, then the poison has overcome me, but I want you to understand what's, what's happened. Your mother is a very, very, very evil person. <clears throat> and this is when the twist comes, the extra twist comes into it, uh, which is actually pretty cool. And I uh, said, so your mother basically uh, was a very evil and cold person. She would, you know, kind of come on to me but I would kind of like to sh shake it off because I was I really really respected your father the one day she seduced me and we made love and she knew exactly what she was doing because she knew your father was going to be coming home at that time and which caused a fight between me and your father and at that point your mother stabbed your father in the back <clears throat> after that you came in and you were just a child and she screamed at you that you'd killed your dad and she you know I can't forgive you you killed your father and he starts to remember things, and that he remembers that this is actually what happened. Uh, he said, now, as for like recently, uh, recently you went in, you're making the film, you were strangling the girl, you're strangling her for too long. That's because your mother used, okay, your mother used her black magic to affect and use my psychic powers. Yes, she used her black magic to use, make him use his psychic powers to persuade him to choke her longer so that he would come back and see his mom. <clears throat> he said, now that you know this, you also must know that the story, the dream that your girlfriend had earlier, but the black mask, that all real ha really happened. <clears throat> so he goes down and he finds the room, the secret room where the whole black mask thing was happening at. He finds these, uh, this book, this uh, book of like uh, kind of a Necronomicon type of like old ancient like book with like uh, satanic stuff in it. And he's like, oh my God, he said, I can't believe this. This It's real. All this is real. All this has actually happened. <clears throat> and his mom's like, so how could you do this? How could you kill my dad? Said, I didn't, though. He said, you're not really my son. You're actually William in my son's body because my son passed out and he died that day. And you went inside the body of, of your son and you're actually the father. And he looked at her like, you're crazy. <clears throat> Uh, and she stabs him. So the girlfriend comes back because one thing we find out on the tape that I didn't tell you yet, and that was for a reason, basically is that the girlfriend just happened to be wearing Solomon's charm or something it was called like that on her neck, which is the one thing that can ward off e the evil. And uh, so when Oliver was commanded to kill her, we find out the mother's killed all the people, by the way, and Oliver's been commanded, but he pretty much botches it up, and the mother has to go actually do the actual killings. Uh, he wasn't able to do it because she's wearing this charm on her. Hello, kitty cat. <clears throat> so she's still alive. So she comes downstairs where, because <clears throat> she realizes all the shit's real now. And, uh, oh no. And basically, uh, lets him, she sees the mother, and she's on this, like, chair that's kind of like, the temple type stone chair that she had for the uh, mass, for the black mass, and she's holding her son who's been stabbed, and he's she's got him wrapped in like white kind of cloth. And it's a really kind of strange sequence, and he's like, "Help me!" And she's like shocked, <clears throat> and starts to run back out, and then the door shuts on her, like shuts her and locks her in there into this like tomb type place where the black mass is going on, and roll credits. So that is the first film we're talking about on Spoiler Talk. Well, why did I choose this film? It's batshit crazy. And it's one that I can talk about and let you know the twists, who the killers and all that stuff. And I think you're still going to want to see it because it's just so weird that it's one that you really have to see. Uh, do I... Rec I wouldn't pay like a lot of money for it. 
but it's worth checking out. Um, it has some uh, cutscene footage in here as well. Um, it's got an interview with the uh, horror film director Sergio Savaletti, which I mentioned before. There, it does have a booklet. Uh, rare stuff comes often with booklets. I, I was gonna watch this one or Waves of Lust, uh, by uh, Rigar, Rigaro Diodato, uh, another filmmaker that I want to get a bunch of his stuff out. Even though I don't agree with some of the stuff that he's done in films, he has pretty much apologized for a lot of the. Uh, this is the only page I can show you. Those I'm new down. Uh, the some stuff they did earlier. He did Cannibal Holocaust, for instance. And he was not a big fan of the animal stuff that was that he did in the films. He said it was a different time. If he had to, to do back, he wouldn't have done it. He wouldn't have used it in the films. It didn't make sense. <clears throat> and I agree with him on that. So hopefully you've been enjoying this. It is a new thing for me. Usually when I'm doing a podcast and my son's here, and I've got like some, or I'm doing a stream, and i got people to kind of like talk off of and bounce things off of. So let me know what you're thinking of this format. How are you thinking? What you think of what I'm doing with it? And uh, how you think I can improve it, different things I can use. I'm going to come back in a minute. We're going to talk about a couple other films in my collection. We're going to talk about the game thing. And uh, I'm going to give you some ideas for uh, some cool starter points. Because today we're talking about Jallo and stuff like that. And uh, that'll be a continuous thing. We're going to talk a lot more about Jallo. I do recommend the Tenor Base Book as a great starter. If you're going into a uh, start in Jallo, I, I do think you should get that and grab that. that. Know, however, before you watch that documentary, that there is a lot of spoilers, a lot. So I'm going to come back. We're going to look at it. I'm going to give you, show you a couple releases that are out there that are fairly inexpensive that can actually you can get, and uh, it'll give you an idea of a uh, of the whole like of the whole Jello thing, and probably make you want to get like a uh, bigger editions and stuff. But uh, let's look into that. So uh, we're going to delve out into my movie shelf and. Uh, I'm going to take out some uh, some needs and wants. Obviously, collecting a lot of the stuff can be expensive, especially when you realize that some of these releases are overseas. Some of these snaps things can cost you $45, 50 bucks. And if you're here in Canada, maybe like $29, $30 when you're, if you're in the States. So if you're not quite sure if Diallo is your type of thing, it's often good to go there and find, even if it's cut up, if the, if the films have some cuts to them, or if you're not sure that what the editions are going to be like, to get some actually some kind of cheap uh, ones to kind of like dip your toe in there. <coughs> so the ones I recommend, uh, there were three sets that were done and they were put up by Popflix. <coughs> and here they are. There is a... Uh, we got Killers on the Loose collection, Blood Red Knights collection, and Deadly Fiends collection. There's actually a lot of stuff in here that's pretty good. <coughs> and I will talk about these now. So the on this set here, and it, they're both two disc sets that come like this. Each had two films on them, so the compression is not that bad. It has the Red Queen Kills Seven Times, which is a uh, by Emilio Magarelli, and it's uh, actually a really good one. It's an early one to, uh, for uh, Sybil Danning. I really film with her in there. Uh, Barbara Bichette is in it as well. Very good Jalo film. Uh, also has the Fifth Chord, which is a movie by Lucio uh, Bazzoni, uh, Franco Nero, who does a lot of like uh, westerns. Near like Django, like Django and stuff like that, he's in there. Um, we have Seven Notes in Black, which is also known in North America as the Psychic, star Jennifer O'Neill. It's by uh, Lucio Fulci. Uh, that's here. And this one also has a classic, really good Fulci film called Don't Torture Duckling, which is an amazing, amazing giallo. Uh, one that I really recommend for uh, anybody. It's like, it's, it's a dark one. I mean, like, there are kids that are being murdered in this one here, <clears throat> but it is a very good film. And this one here has, um, all of these are widescreen. I would have to look into it to see if these are uncut or not. You can check online to, to, to see. I didn't have the chance to look into it tonight. I apologize. I'll be more prepared. This is my very first time doing this one here. But they each have like a, a poster of the film by it as well. And a little synapses. And this is a, this one here, Cures and This These are four good films. Uh, next up is Deep Red. That's going to get you a bit into the Argento stuff. And de like Deep Red will definitely be cut. It's basically, it's called Blood Red Nights. But have it has Deep Red on it, which is, is definitely cut. Uh, like that one's the only uh, only like 149 minute version. But still, it's a, it's a great film to check out. Cat of Nine Tales, which is another Argento film. 
and uh, <clears throat> has a Carl Malden in it. And uh, we have the Blood, Seven Bloodstained Orchids, which is by Umberto Lenzi. Remember the guy I told you about? Uh, <clears throat> here as well. And we have one by Aldo Leto called Seven Nights, like Short Night of Glass Dolls, which is actually considered to be a really good one. So, again, one to check out. There are, this one is done slightly different. You'll notice that this one here has a flipper disc as opposed to having them like this. <clears throat> which makes me wonder if maybe I, that one was a, broke, the case broke and I had to change this, that I'll find out soon. So there's the covers here as well. Now you can get uncut, like pimped out special editions of most of these films here. This is just a very good, very inexpensive way to like just get get these films for the first time and like start uh, start checking them out. The other one they put out was Deadly Fiends Collection. And this also has some really great stuff. <clears throat> so you see it right here and as when you open it up we'll find out. So yeah. Actually, this one here is also done <clears throat> like this. <clears throat> kind of cool. So, it has the case of the Bloody Iris, which has uh, Edwidge, Edwidge Finch. And Edwidge Finch is a uh, beautiful, like, uh, brunette actress. She did a lot of, like, sexploitation, like, kind of stuff back in the day. And she did a lot of these Jalo films. Whenever you see a movie with her in a Jalo film, it's usually a pretty good one. So, watch for her name. Uh, or also George Hilton, who acts in a lot of these things as well. Hilton's also another good name for this type of stuff. Second one, your voice is locked room, is locked room and only have the key. Again, we have Edward Finnich and Anita Strindberg, or who I told you about for uh, Murder Obsession as well. So they're both, and that's a Serge Martino. Serge Martino and Argento are two names that you are looking for when you're looking for a Jello film. Those those two names will not steer you wrong. Serge Martino's torso, which is uh, which is Jello, but still uh, almost has a bit of like slasher to it as well. It's a uh, brilliantly, magnificently well done film. Uh, Death Laid an Egg is here with Gina Little Brigida. Uh, we have uh, The Dark is Death's Friend by Lucio Cosi. Uh, that one again has George Hilton in it. <clears throat> so I haven't, I'm, I don't remember The Dark is Death's Friend right now. I'm sure I probably know it under a different name. And <clears throat> and the things, I collect the Jello. So basically, I'll, I got those sets there, even though I got like the yeah, bit better editions of like the other ones as well these are kind of like nice ones that i'll put on every once in a while when i don't want to like just get my stuff out or i want to or i want to loan some to a friend and i don't loan them like the bigger editions i usually loan them one of these to actually see if he's into that type of uh, work so these were three put up by pop flicks and they're usually pretty cheap i know that uh, for a short period of time apparently one of these got pulled but uh they got it worked out and they're all put back on again so i don't think there's any changes made in them so here they are all three of them, and they are pretty sexy looking cases as well. I think that they're very well done. I like the fact that they have the uh, the covers of the films, like the, the posters, the actual posters of films on the back of each uh, of each one with a, with a pretty decent synopsis. And I'm just checking here to make sure. But it looks like all of these movies were done in their actual widescreen ra ratio, which is actually pretty cool. So that's a good way to start out. When you're looking for a gel and stuff like that, <clears throat> there's a company in England. If you're a region free player, or you're, if you are from England or Europe, then you probably already know about this company. But if you don't, there's a company called Shameless Entertainment. They specialize in Jello and like uh, kind of like Italian sexploitation and stuff like that. Uh, they put out a lot of the great stuff. Uh, Strange Vice of Mrs. Ward, Sister of Ursula. They put out, uh, I know that Blue Underground put out a Blu ray of the Bronx Warriors trilogy. Uh, picture was okay on it, wasn't like stunning. Uh, but I know that there's an edition put up by Shameless with a big steel case. I really want it actually, and uh, and a skull head on it. And uh, that's what I'm going to be picking up down the road. I might get it with some birthday money actually. So uh, <clears throat> that's there as well. So they have like a lot of different Italian, mostly like they deal with a lot of Jalo stuff, like Strange Vice, Miss Ward's there, Sister Versala's there, uh, Footprints on the Moon. I know it sounds like a science fiction film, but it's, it's actually Jalo. Uh, that's there. Jalos also have really kind of colorful names, as you can see by the ones there. It had really strange names, long names. Uh, Jello stories basically are mysteries and they take a little bit farther. They usually have a lot of nudity in them, so know that going in. Uh, they have like unique sh um, deaths and uh, names that you should know for Jello are Dara Gento, Mero Bava, Umberto Bava as well actually. That's the son of Mero Bava. Uh, Sergio Martino. Uh, there are so many that are out there. They're that do great stuff and I want to go in more into Jello and I don't want to like do it all 
in one uh, in one shot but this is a new format that I'm still trying to work out so here here it was tonight my very first uh, time to do doing fade to black I'll have guests on here at times we'll uh, I'll actually have fade to black hopefully like fingers crossed if you guys like this we'll have fade to black streams as well and we'll just see how we can uh, where we can like move it from there so for now this is Aaron signing off because uh my tea is not on, it's not cold this time it's actually gone and uh I'm in desperate need of tea after all this talk I think I'm going to sit back and watch the jello so uh for me right now it's time to tea it's time to tea it's time for tea and it is time for this podcast to fade to black Thank you.